STS-27 was my, was my third launch, and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm, and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there, and we brought up the television image of the right wing, and I looked at what I was seeing, and I said to myself, we are going to die. The Lysander is a strange airplane. Compared to the Spitfire or Mustang, it's a big aircraft with a wingspan of about 50 feet. It was designed for short takeoffs and landings from rough, unprepared airfields. Its role was to provide the British Army with reconnaissance, artillery spotting, and general communications capability. Nicknamed the Lizzie, the Lysander was produced by Westland Aircraft and used immediately before and during the Second World War. Like other British Army air cooperation aircraft, it was given the name of a military leader. In this case, the Spartan General Lysander. The first Lysanders entered service in June 1938. Four regular squadrons equipped with Lysenders accompanied the British Expeditionary Force to France in October 1939 and were joined by a further squadron early in 1940. Hi. Following the German invasion of France and the Low Countries on the 10th of May 1940, Lysanders were put into action as spotters and light bombers. In spite of occasional victories against German aircraft, they made very easy targets for the Luftwaffe, even when escorted by hurricanes. <laughs> One hundred and eighteen Lysanders were lost in or over France and Belgium in May and June 1940, of a total of 175 deployed. With the fall of France, it was clear that the type was unsuitable for the coastal patrol and army cooperation role, being described by Air Marshal Arthur Barrett, Commander-in-Chief of the British Air Forces in France, as quite unsuited to the task. Once France was lost, the Westland Lysander was retasked with special duties and was used with great success making clandestine flights into occupied territory at night on secret missions vital to the outcome of World War II to place or recover agents, particularly in occupied France with the help of the French resistance. The Lysander introduced stall, short takeoff and landing capability crucial to today's military, long before the term was coined. As a flagship for spying missions behind the lines, it had no equal. 
a small lone aircraft winging through the night into enemy skies with little fanfare except for perhaps diversionary missions by other aircraft in order to attract attention. This was stealth technology in the 1940s during World War II, and Westland Lysanders flown by the RAF were one of the original stealth aircraft. Restorer Mike Potter bought Lysander Charlie Foxtrot Victor Zulu Zulu from a Saskatchewan farm. Used briefly post-war as a crop duster, it had languished for decades until being largely restored by a Saskatchewan collection and warbird restorer, Harry Wariat, the man who also began the restoration on the Hawker Hurricane 12, joining us today. The Lysander is currently owned by John Carswell of Toronto, whose father, Andy Carswell, flew them with the RCAF. Pilot Dave Hatfield has said that flying a Lysander is truly a remarkable experience. One gets the feeling that with 20 hours or so in the airplane, you could do amazing things with it. Too bad they were never put on floats. Bush flying with a Lysander would be eye-opening. So just to go back in time and tell you about where this airplane came from, it's a Westland Lysander designed in 1934, 1935. First flight was in 1936. And it was designed to be a battlefield liaison aircraft to take a general up in that back cockpit there and show him the battlefield. Now in those days, what they were using for that role were biplanes. And this was a much more advanced machine. So it was highly touted, highly promoted, highly regarded by the Royal Air Force and the British Air Ministry. It was quite cutting edge for its time. Unfortunately, they didn't know that World War II wasn't going to work out like World War I, right? There weren't any trenches in World War II the same way, and it was a battle, and it was a battle of movement. And so uh, it didn't work out in that original uh, battlefield reconnaissance role when the Germans conquered France in two weeks. But the airplane was very adaptable for other jobs, and so it was used uh, through all theaters of war and in North America, in Canada, with the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan uh, for a number of different uh, purposes, particularly gunnery training. So this one, a Canadian-built Lysander, built in Toronto, would deploy a, a reel, a kind of a bomb bay in the bottom, big fishing reel thing about this, this big, and a thousand feet of line with a drogue on the end of that. And then other aircraft like ferry battles would come along with a gunner in the back seat with a machine gun, and they'd teach him how to shoot the drogue. So that was its primary role. This particular airframe, or as a Canadian built airplane, its primary role in World War II. So the Lysander, uh, in addition to its role over here as a training airplane, served very effectively over in Europe, and it gained fame for its role with the Special Operations Executive, which was a spy plane and a spy delivery service. So they would take a, uh, the full moon period, about a week before to a week afterwards, and they would put spies in the back seat and um, fly them to a pasture in France. And these pastures were selected by members of the French resistance who had been trained by the Royal Air Force to pick a field that didn't have wires and trees and ditches and all that sort of thing. And it would land on the light of three flashlights. Of course, it was also a full moon, but um, down on the field there, they'd have three uh, French resistance people with a, shining a torch up and, you know, a, f a flashlight up in, in an L shape. It'd be one guy here, one guy here, one guy over here. And the airplane would land in between them, taxi to the end, turn around, come back. And as it came back, there was a ladder bolted to the other side of the airframe, uh, beside the co uh, rear cockpit. Some spies would be tumbling out, other guys would be climbing on board. Everybody trying to get this transfer done before the Gestapo sh showed up, right? And then it would turn back, get into position. Pilot would never shut down. And then uh, open up the throttle, take off, head back to England. So that was a very successful operation. And they did many, many missions with a, a, a good survival uh, rate and a good mission accomplishment rate. 
It's a challenging airplane to fly, the Lysander. Um, you know, if, if with most of the World War II high-performance airplanes like the Mustang and Spitfire Hurricane, things like that, if you have a background in a T6 like that one, and uh, you know, you've got the hands and feet skills for the stick and rudder stuff, and then someone shows you on the, high on the fighter how to start the engine and uh, how the fuel system works, how to get the gear up and down, you could take off and land and, and uh, probably keep it in one piece. And they're not that difficult to fly. But not this thing. This has got a bunch of gotchas. I mean, it, it does the job really well, but it has some uh, quirks. Uh, the first thing is those flaps. Now, from this angle, you can't see the slats on the other end, but their leading edge device is kind of like those flaps, but they're at the front of the wing, and they're interconnected. As the, the front ones go out, they drive the back ones, the flaps down, and um, it's completely automatic. The pilot can't extend them, retract them, or lock them in either position. So that's really interesting on approach because as, you, as the nose goes up and down on approach, these things go on out and back on their own and destabilize you because the drag on the lift changes with every setting, right? So you can end up going like a slinky down steps by mistake, you know, and screwing up your whole approach. So that's unusual. You have to, in this airplane, understand how that works configure the airplane at the right speed so the slats and flaps come out to the level you want, which is initial approach is 80 miles an hour, and then maintain that for the rest of your approach and, and try not to change it. And if you're going high, the side slip it off like a biplane. At least that's what I do. Other people can do whatever they want, you know, the other two that are flying in the world, but that's what I find works for this one. So that's the first challenge. The second is the elevator, even though it looks large, is not big enough to control the airplane at either end of the envelope. The, uh, if you have the stick in the middle and you're coming in on approach at 80, sorry, if you have the trim in the middle and you're coming in at 80 and then you pull the power off and try to flare, the nose will just plunk down even if you have the stick buried in your gut. Um, and conversely, if you want to go around and the trim is in the middle and you put the power up to go around thrust, uh, the airplane will go for the, the moon even if you have the stick jammed into the panel. So it doesn't have enough authority. And there, we have lots of great airplanes flying here. Um, so what they did as a solution is the horizontal stabilizer in the front uh, moves on a jack screw, kind of like a cub, right? And you need the authority of that to accomplish either a flare for a landing or a go around. So from the pilot's point of view, that's really weird. And you have to pre-position that trim, pre-position that horizontal stabilizer to give the authority that you're gonna need 10 seconds from now when you pull the power off or when you jam the, or when you go around. So that's a different way of thinking, right? The third thing is it's a completely free-floating, free-castering tailwheel. And the brakes, you can't lock it and you can't steer with it. Um, but the brakes don't work very well and never have, no matter, and I've seen the conversion to hydraulic brakes. These are nomadic bladder brakes. And it just doesn't seem to matter. They just never did work that well in World War II. They don't work that well now. You know, if you're landing this thing in a big grass pasture into wind, no big deal, you don't need brakes. But uh, operating out of modern airports with skinny taxiways and and confined areas, it can be a real challenge. It tends to want to stay straight on landing. You know, it's less challenging that way than a T6 or Harvard, but uh, trying to taxi off the runway in a strong wind can be very uh, difficult. You know, I've, I've been in situations where I've taxied up into the wind shadow of a building so I could turn around and go the direction I want to go. Or I carry a uh, a sprightly and nimble young person in the back seat and they hop out, push the tail around so I'm angled where I want to go, then they hop in and, and so you, you really have to think about how you're going to leave the runway and get to the airport ramp. Yeah, ground handling is a challenge on the Lysander. Uh, it helps if you've flown a float plane or a ski plane because it isn't the landing that's, that concerns you the most with those two configurations, right? It's how, what do you do after? You know, how do I get to the dock or how do I get to the ramp on skis when you don't have any brakes? It's a lot like that.
So in the middle 1930s, when this airplane came out, it was a big innovation and improvement on the biplanes that were flying mostly at the time. And it had a defensive machine gun in the rear cockpit, right? And it had its own two machine guns, forward firing in the spats, could carry little bombs. And the, and the Air Ministry and the Royal Air Force at the time thought it was going to be a, a great and efficient multi-purpose aircraft, be a bit of a bomber, a bit of a fighter, and a bit of an observation airplane. But they didn't understand or didn't prepare for how much aircraft were evolving, how quickly that process was taking place in the late 30s, early 40s. So they, they sent about 100 and, 170, I think, of these to France you know, before the Germans invaded. And they didn't understand the Germans were going to conquer France in two weeks, right, which is what happened. And uh, during that period, um, the, the 109s, the Messerschmitt 109s, uh, shot these down in frequently. And I think 118 of them were lost during that whole battle. So it was not successful in a battlefield reconnaissance role. But it's a very flexible airframe and structure and capable. It's got a big engine, it's got a big wing, so you could do lots of other things with it, including dropping off spies. They also had a little uh, little winglet that go out from those uh, wheel pants, or spats as they call them, and you could mount a, a, a air sea rescue raft under that. And they flew over the channel and, and dropped rafts to uh, pilots or, or, or uh, you know, merchant seamen who had been sunk by, by e-boats and submarines and things like that, and mines. So it was a search and rescue aircraft. As I mentioned earlier, it, it, uh, it towed a long drogue for gunnery training. They were used in North Africa for all kinds of liaison there for delivering parts and, and uh, people to the squadrons out in the Western Desert. And uh, yeah, it, it, it served right to the end of the war. They made about 1,800 of them total, including 220 in Canada. It's really important to keep these airplanes alive to restore them and to fly them, to maintain them, to keep the history going, because it's not taught in school books the way you know, it could be, perhaps. And it's up to individuals uh, like the, uh, the owner of this airplane, John Carswell from Toronto, whose father flew them in World War II, and uh, uh, people from my own flight ops department, our maintainers, you know, they keep the whole picture alive in, during World War II, Canada, the United States, of course, was the arsenal of democracy. Canada, they called the aerodrome of democracy. And one of our principal roles in World War II was to provide pilots and navigators and gunners and wireless air operators and, all, and mechanics and everybody else. We trained uh, over 200,000 of those people at all the airfields spread across Canada. An enormous effort. We built all those airfields in one year. I can imagine doing that now. It's just incredible effort. It was really successful. When the whole program started, 19, the end of 1939, Winston Churchill said, don't send me 100 pilots tomorrow. Send me 10,000 pilots in a year. And we did. It was an incredible achievement. And so to keep that alive, it's really important to rescue these old airplanes, do whatever we have to do to keep them flying. So I talked about some of the challenges of operating it on the ground and on approach and landing and everything. But when you're in flying in this thing, it's actually uh, a really capable airplane. I do an air show routine of uh, wing overs really close to the crowd. I turn away from the crowd like the crowd's here. I'm doing wing overs like this, so I'm never pointing at them. But I can keep this airplane really close, really in tight. And the sound picture's changing, the sight picture's changing. Those slats and flaps are going out and in and out and in, and I don't have to pay any attention to them. The airplane is, uh, will accelerate to 200 miles an hour on the down runs and uh, up to about 80 on the, on the top of the wing overs. There's no risk, there's no threat. It's extremely capable. It's the original hands-on throttle end stick airplane. Right? I don't have to select any flaps or slats. I don't have to worry about speeds or, or ex exceeding a flap speed or anything like that. All I have to do is watch the ground and watch my movement. And uh, it's supreme at that. So the Lysander has a, a max speed, but I don't go anywhere near that. There's no reason to. And uh, if I get going too fast, it tends to pop off those inspection plates on the top of the wing. So 
180, 190 is all I want to do on a, on a pass on an air show routine. But yeah, you can fly it a lot faster. People tend to group this airplane with the Fiesler Storch as if it is sort of the British answer to the Fiesler Storch. And that's not correct. Uh, Storch can only go slow. Uh, this can go 200 miles an hour as well as going slow. And if you went 200 miles an hour in a Storch, you know, you'd rip the wings off. So it, it, uh, it's much more of an airplane. They're, they're, the two of them are quite different. We don't have a stall speed on this. And it talks about that in the manual because every pilot wants to know that. Uh, I, I bring it down to 60 at touchdown. I approach at 80, wind the trim, flare, three point, and generally if I look over as it touchdown, we're doing about 60. Now, the manual says the stall speed's a lot lower, but they also say to recover from a full stall takes over a thousand feet. So we just don't do it. The only way you can get this to stall is to wind the trim to the, you know, the horizontal stabilizer to the full extent, use a bunch of power to get the nose way up, and then bring the power off. And it's a, it's a major, you're, you're entering a major maneuver. And if it does stall, yeah, it recovers eventually in a normal fashion, but uses up a lot of airspace. So we just don't go there. Don't loop it, don't roll it. It's not for that. So one of the tricks of flying a Lysander is getting in the darn thing and then coming down without falling down. And uh, so far I've been successful. This little piece of tape uh, identifies when I'm coming back down where I'm going to put my foot so I can see it. But anyway, what I do is right foot there, left foot there, switch up, hand hold here, right here. There's a foot uh, pad right there, up, switch feet in the stirrup, grab here, step on the seat. And you're in. And you're a long way up. You really are. Uh, the seat also goes up and down. I'm at the highest. And you can taxi it looking over the nose, standing up in the seat, because you've got a hand grip here for brakes. You know, it's a British brake system with the uh, spade grip and uh, a hand grip for the brakes. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting airplane to mount. It's like climbing the rigging on a square rig ship. We come down here and there are many, many of these fasteners. You can call them Zeus fasteners, but they're not. They're, they're related, but they're a British version. Uh, and uh, you need some sort of uh, tool to, to go have in your pocket or have handy as you go around the airplane because many of them start to, to move and uh, you don't want them to, to become loose because most of these are big panels that can be removed quickly and easily so you can access the airplane for maintenance and service. And so you don't want them falling off the airplane. The airplane does shake a little bit. So uh, as you do the walk around, you're checking those continuously. The engine is a Bristol Mercury 20. It's the only one flying in North America. And uh, it's rare. I, I find it to be a very good engine and I, I enjoy flying behind it. Uh, it's 850 horsepower. It's geared, you can see the gear case at the front of the engine there, that bullet nose there. And it's also supercharged. It's got a geared supercharger in it. Nine cylinder, and it's got poppet valves. It's not a sleeve valve. Uh, they, Bristol also made a Perseus engine with sleeve valves, and they were in some Lysanders, but not the Mark III, which is what this is. So uh, it's got some unusual features. The first for ground service is, uh, is pretty, really handy. You just undo these two doors, and there's three over center links, a couple, you know, three diaper pins, and then you can release that. The bottom cowl pops off. The other one rotates off. You need a couple helpers, but it, it's easy. And then you've got the whole engine, whole front of the engine exposed. It's quite good, and uh, it's an external valve. Um, the, well, the valve heads are, the valve stems and springs are exposed. So it's very easy to see if you've got a broken valve spring or you've got a sticky valve. Like it's a really quick and easy check. I like that, even though it spreads a lot of oil and you have to grease the, uh, you know, you have to lubricate those, uh, uh, every, every, the rocker arms every once in a while. Um, the gills, well, I've got them closed at the moment, but these pop off and out very easily. So, um, I mean, it's a very rare engine, the Bristol Mercury and uh, pretty much impossible to find parts for now because it wasn't used in commercial service the way in our 
you know, our 2800 or, or an 1830 was. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but um, this one, uh, you know, we've been able to keep going. And uh, I, I have hopes it'll last several hundred more hours before the next overhaul. The propeller is very unusual. It's a de Havilland uh, propeller, not a route, a doughty rotol like many of the British have. And it's two position only, course or fine. It's not constant speed. So you take off with it in fine. As soon as you get airborne, you pull it to course so you don't over rev it. And that's the way it is for the rest of the flight until you get on short final. Um, this is a very unusual feature. That's your exhaust collector ring and it's built into the whole front of the cowl, right? Uh, this was a Bristol uh, idea, and so it equipped uh, some other uh, aircraft like the uh, Gloucester Gladiator, but a very British uh, way to do things. And then, so all the exhaust pipes, and there's four valves per cylinder, two exhaust, two intake. If you look up in there, you can see pipes going from the cylinder to this, you know. Those are the exhaust pipes, and they're all loose. They're, they're in there with a uh, 16th of an inch clearance. They kind of rattle around in there until they get hot, and then they expand and seal up. So this whole collector ring feeds into this pipe, big, long exhaust pipe. And that was uh, partly to um, just to keep, the, you know, to keep the flames away from the, the, the aircraft, but also to reduce its uh, sound signature. So the airplane was very, very quiet. If you pull the RPM back to course and the manifold pressure back, uh, it's a quiet airplane. You know, quieter than a lot of these Cessnas and things. What else? Uh, this is an exciter tube that goes down through the center of the pipe and you can connect it up so you can get cabin heat in there, which was a, you know, a lot of the pilots back in the 30s were flying biplanes and they had to suit themselves up with those they're very, very thick sheep's wool. Uh, and they really like having heat in the cockpit and a, and a canopy that went over top and kept the rain and the snow off. So uh, those were big features in their day. The landing gear, there's a big aluminum arch there that functions, oh, like a Cessna 195 or something like that, sure. Uh, but there are also shock absorbers built right into the wheel hub itself. So you've got a double system there for absorbing the ground shocks and big wheels. Very unusual tire size, I'll tell you that. We, had, we put these new ones on this year, and they were hard to find. Big landing lights, and we, the aircraft also had uh, parachute flare tubes in the back. The pilot could deploy them. So the pilot could light up a big pasture, then use his lights to come in and land with a lot of illumination, but they didn't do that in France with the spies because it would tell the Gestapo where they were. Right? However, the capability is there. This is where the 303 machine guns were. And um, with just two screws here, you could open up the back to uh, remove the, the gun or, or service the breech or whatever's required. The ammunition belts fed down from there. This panel is easily removed and they could put a stub wing here and then mount uh, little bombs on it or uh, air sea rescue rafts or whatever is required. They even did some mail drops and mail pickups, you know, while flying in North Africa. So that's, uh, you know, during the walk around, I'm looking at the gear, making sure uh, the, all the fasteners are in place, making sure the tires are solid. Lots of inspection panels in the wing. You know, they wanted to be able to, to service that flap slat mechanism. So that's why all those removed. Those hinge down panels are there so you can access the inside of the wing. Moving farther aft, you can see the different construction of the aircraft. These panels remove very easily, and that gives you uh, total access to the inside of the airplane. It's, it's really quite remarkable. This is an original panel, but of course we have some modern um, electronic components in there, but we kept the original. This is a rack for, for very pistols, you know, signaling pistols. And uh, there's, shoot, there's a shoot up, or a tube at the top. Put the pistol, the barrel in there and, and shoot the colors of the day. So you don't get shot down by the, uh, uh, you know, the anti-aircraft units on your own side. These are the push tubes for the elevator, right? 
and the rudder. So when you're loading the airplane up and baggage, everything has to be secured in there so nothing can contact these two uh, tubes. Now the structure, it's really unique. It's very solid tubing you know, with, up here, this is the hawker way, the British way of joining tubes um, with uh, rivets, right? They square off the tube, some of the tubes are round and they square off the end. And then you've got rivets here with spacers in between so you can't collapse them. And that's how they joined a cluster of tubes. But farther aft in the airplane, they welded. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't pick one or the other. Hawker, they're all joined like this, you know, the Hawker Hurricane and the, the, the Fury and the Hart and the Hind and all those biplanes. In the British Empire, they didn't send out oxyacetylene everywhere for welding. But you can make a you can make a rivet you can replace a rivet with a hammer and a rock you know so it was simpler that way. So the you've got this steel structure, and then you've got wood to give it shape, and then fabric. So it's very 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 light. But you have to be very careful in the walk around that everything's pinned in place, or you'll lose one of these, and they're awfully hard to replace. You know, we talked about spies earlier. This gentleman from the Canadian Maritimes, Cliff Stewart, he rode a Lysander into uh, dark fields in France to teach the French resistance five times about uh, ciphers and codes and dynamite and all that sort of thing. I never talked about it. He said, I was sworn to secrecy, and I'm not allowed to say that. And he did that right till he died. He was almost 100 years old. So when during the walk around and being very careful about all these pins, when it comes to the rear cockpit, you've got, you need someone who's 19 years old and has long legs, right? So you can, it's hard to find what to grab onto up here, but they got to step here and then there. And I got a rope there that I pull out to help me get up there without a ladder and uh, into the back seat. And the canopy can be, in any position for flying, doesn't matter. Further back here, we've got uh, an option to change, well, a number of different things. So these are the, the parachute flare tubes I was telling you about. And I need a little ballast back here for CAG, so I got them full of oil, uh, which uh, obviously you need on the road. And um, depending on whether they had machine guns there or nothing or towing a drogue or you could change the ballast. These are big lead weights and you just pull a pin and slide those on or off as required. So you have this deck. CAG is a little sensitive for landing on this, so you've got to stay uh, back a bit. Anyway, the horizontal stabilizer is aluminum, which is strange since very little, of, and same with the fin, different than everything else. Again, you're looking at all these fastenings, making sure you haven't Punched a hole last time you landed, you know, with the, the bottom of the elevator. Fabric's intact. Tail wheel, like I said before, it's uh, free castering. Can't steer it, can't lock it. Makes landing, taxiing very interesting. Thanks for coming. This is Dave Hatfield, and he is the pilot and the authority on this airplane, and he's very well qualified. He is the chief pilot of Vintage Wings of Canada. He comes from a large aviation family. You have, what, eight flying at this time? Yeah, eight of us fly now. His brother is Chris, and he was the first Canadian astronaut to walk in space. He's a retired Air Canada pilot, his Warbird qualifications are some of these. He's got a lot more. He's got a P-40, P-51, Spitfire, Hurricane, Lysander, and many others. Is that correct? Is that good? He's also a musician, a songwriter, a sailor, and an author, and that's for another day. All right. Have a seat. Thanks, Sam.
Dave, this is a, to say the least, a very unique airplane. And part of the history was covered up here in the Jumbotron. But would you kind of elaborate on the development of this airplane, why it was developed? Sure. So um, this, was a, this was designed in the middle 1930s when most air forces in the world, and particularly the Royal Air Force, were flying biplanes. And they wanted a, a battlefield observation and utility airplane uh, to, to be in place for the next war. And so um, Westland took the unusual step of actually going to the pilots of the Royal Air Force and saying, what would you like? in an airplane of that kind and, and uh, canvassed all the responses and put them together into the design of this airplane. And they wanted an airplane, the pilots wanted an airplane where they could see really well. And the visibility from that thing is uh, superb. The pilot can adjust his seat so you're exactly at the uh, wing level. So uh, only a very small part of the view is blocked out. You can see above, you can see below. The windows come way down. So you just a little bit of angle of bank, you have a perfect view. And of course, it's the same for the person in the back seat. So if you're taking up a general or something to show him the front lines, he could see everything very clearly. The other thing that pilots wanted was uh, really good stole characteristics, short takeoff and landing, so, so that they could land very close to the battlefield. And they wanted the capability to land through uh, ditches and mud and obstacles and rocks and all that sort of thing. And you can see the result, of course, in the design of this main landing gear. They wanted heat. They wanted a canopy, all those things you don't necessarily have in a biplane. They wanted an engine with a self-starter because, uh, you know, those Hawker biplanes from the 1930s didn't have uh, a starter in the Kestrel engines. They had a, a Model T type of a, a contraption that would spin up the propeller called a Huck starter. So all these things were put together by the uh, Westland team and they came up with this design. It looks a little unusual to our eyeball, but uh, in 1935 it was uh, innovation and cutting edge. Well, how about the specifications on the airplane? Specifications? Yeah, I thought the engine did uh, and yeah, range. Well, it's, a, it's a big airplane, as you can see, a 50-foot wingspan. Uh, it's, it's heavy, but you can make it maneuver. It's a fairly, it's very light on the rudders, sort of normal in pitch uh, for the range that you can actually control it in and uh, a little bit heavy in the ailerons, but you can make it move, you can make it cavort. The, uh, shall I talk about the flaps and slats? That's yes, go ahead. Yeah, talk yeah, about so it. the most unusual feature that they designed into the airplane, hey, Xavier, would you come down here? This is one of our support team members, Xavier from Quebec and from Vintage Wings. If, if you wouldn't mind climbing up on that side, and, and, and I'll sh he'll show you how the flaps and slats work, and this is really unique. Now, leading edge slats, the ones on the front of the wing, are in two sections. And yeah, the hardest thing is not falling off that airplane, to be honest. Uh, I've been flying it around for uh, six, seven years now, and I haven't fallen off yet, and I'm really proud of that. But Bad anyway, that you. pardon? Bad that wasn't you, we'd be calling an ambulance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So many airplanes have leading edge uh, slats, and they're activated totally by the airflow. But in this airplane, they're linked to the flaps through some very clever uh, gearing and chains and springs and um, that sort of thing. They're cross-controlled or cross-linked so that they can't be go out asymmetrically and give you a roll, which you wouldn't want. They don't come out in any gradations. They just come out very smoothly. So as you decelerate, starting at about 105 miles an airplane, the way or miles an hour, the way this airplane is rigged, they start creeping out, and uh, they're completely out by the time you flare and touch down at about 60. So uh, it's very transparent as a pilot. You don't, you can't select them, you can't lock them in, can't lock them out, can't extend them, can't retract them. They're completely automatic. And uh, that is some really interesting ramifications for when you're on approach. Well, does it change your pitch attitude? Yeah. Thanks, Xavier. So 
Yeah, as as you change your pitch attitude, you change the uh, the, the lift vector, which which uh, influences where the slats and flaps go. So if you're, it has some strange characteristics. If you're on approach and you're just a little high, the tendency is to lower the nose. As soon as you do that, uh, the angle of attack decreases, the flaps and slats come in, the airspeed shoots up and you go way long. Uh, on the converse side, if you're a little bit uh, short, you pull the nose up, angle of attack increases, they deploy to the maximum. The uh, speed drops, you start this tremendous descent rate, and then if you goose the throttle, the Bristol Mercury has a, a really unusual accelerator pump. It's over-muscled, much bigger than it has to be in the carburetor, and you get what's called a rich cut. So the engine quits just when you're coming down like a ton of bricks. And uh, there are lots of World War II pictures of these things plonked down under the ground 300 feet short of the runway with the wings draped over them. So uh, it's unusual, this whole flaps and slats thing. Now, when you're just maneuvering, like over a battlefield, or as you saw in the video at an air show display, uh, it's a piece of cake. It's great. It's wonderful. It's the original hands-on throttle and stick. You don't have to deploy anything. But in this landing environment, you can't, you can't move the nose up and down on approach. It just uh, destabilizes everything. So uh, what I tend to do, and of course, this is just my own method, but on the downwind leg, I get the speed back to 80, so I have a good deployment of these. And I get the power back uh, to a rate of descent that's probably going to get me at the touchdown point, uh, you know, more or less. And then maybe I stay a little bit high, and then I try not to touch either power or speed, keep them constant. And I do a slipping turn onto final, and then side slip as required, just like it's a Stearman or a Waco, to get to, to adjust the touchdown point. And that's what I find works out for me. And um, uh, generally, it's a three-point landing, and, and uh, the airplane likes to do that. It does that better than a wheeler, and uh, it tends to stay straight. So that's, that's, those are good characteristics, and that's what I've worked out how, how to land well, a thing. While you're talking about that, you mentioned to me yesterday that uh, an average warbird pilot that's got a lot of time in a T-6 or something, they could normally just transfer into a P-51 or P-47, but this airplane doesn't work that way. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, yeah, so as, as Sam said, if you have a tail dragger background and you check out in a T-6 and you've got those kinds of skills and you walk up to a fighter, a Mustang or something, and someone tells you how to get the gear up and down, how to start it, how the fuel systems work, chances are you could get it around the patch and on the ground again without uh, damaging it, but not this airplane. It's weird. The, uh, in addition to that flaps and slat thing, the elevator is not powerful enough to control the airplane at either end of the envelope. So if you're coming down on final and you have the trim in the middle, and then uh, you pull the power to idle, to flare, you could pull the stick right back to your spine and it'll just go like this and arrow into the earth. Same thing if you're going around. If you had the trim in the middle and you went to go around power, the thing will go for the moon even if you had the stick buried in the instrument panel. So that's not so great. <laughs> the, uh, the original test pilot from Westland in 1936, Harold Penrose, when I mean, he first took it up, uh, you know, he was exploring the landing environment there before he came down and committed for landing, and he had trouble getting it into a landing attitude, and he had to do that with a combination of power and blowing air over the tail and getting the nose up and then just keeping that going till he plunked it down. And he suggested that they completely redesign the horizontal surfaces on the tail. But instead, uh, Westland wanted to get the airplane operational, and so did the Royal Air Force, because it was a a big PR effort, uh, you know, the new airplane for the Royal Air Force. They wanted to get this into service. So they put the horizontal stabilizer on a jack screw, and that's the trim mechanism, kind of like a cub. And so you have to use it to control the airplane. You need the authority of the horizontal stabilizer to flare the airplane or go around. So this is a little different from a pilot's point of view, right? You, uh, The way I do it is when I'm about 200 feet above the ground, I commit. I'm landing, period. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if a truck comes out, it'll go around it. And at that point, I lock the stick, you know, with my hand, 
And then I start winding the trim, which is a horizontal stabilizer, back so that 15 seconds from now, I can pull the power back and I have the authority I need to flare. So that's a very different way of uh, operating an airplane. So. You've got to think what you're going to need, the control regime you're going to need in 15 or 20 seconds. Well, how did you figure that out the first time? I almost I almost plunked it into the ground, right? And I went, whoa, that's not very good. I'm not doing that again. So uh, I worked out with our, uh, our, our ch chief pilot at the time, who was a very experienced tef test pilot, John Aitken. And uh, he was a chief test pilot for the National Research Council of Canada. And we you know, worked out a, uh, a, a regime and a, a way to fly it for takeoff and landing that suits the airplane. Well, tell us about that, the little guns up here on the spats. So these spats are really interesting. Uh, they're not just uh, decorations. They house a bunch of mechanisms. I can get up here, right? Sure. So um, uh, this, this is where the 303 machine guns were, one on each side. And two screws, you can open up this and expose the breech mechanism of the gun and, and remove it. This was the belt feed down for it. So in, when they went to France in 1940, they had carried guns, and the guy in the back seat had a machine gun for defensive fire. So that was one option for that. The, um, the spats are hiding uh, uh, a shock absorber that's right built into the wheel hub. So not only do we have the flex of the whole uh, arch of the gear, uh, leg, but you've got a shock absorber built right into these big wheels, too. So that really helps on the rough ground. And then these four, uh, this, this plate could be removed, and then a little stub wing would come out, and they could hang uh, small bombs off that, or a uh, life raft, and they use this for search and rescue in the English Channel. And, uh, you know, if there was a pilot uh, floating down there with a, in a life jacket, they could drop a raft, a, a safety raft, a rescue raft to him. So it had, uh, it was a very flexible airplane. You could configure it for a lot of different jobs. So that, what you, in the video up here, it said it was not successful as uh, in uh, liaison, if you want to call it that. Could you extemporary on? Sorry, sort of what? Uh, about it was not successful as far as liaison earlier. Sure, in the sure. World. Um, when they designed the airplane, they figured that the next war would be kind of like the last war, right? Uh, it would be a bit like World War I with trenches and, and fixed uh, fighting lines. And so this would be great for taking a general up to see what's what. However, of course, nobody expected that the, uh, in, in, that the Germans would conquer France in two weeks in May of 1940, and that the battle was a battle of movement. So there wasn't really the role for this airplane, and uh, it couldn't defend itself against the Messerschmitt 109s. It just it wasn't successful in that role. But it's such a flexible airplane uh, that they were able to use it for many other jobs right. uh, afterwards. Or, and the clandestine, give us a, just a typical flight for a clandestine flight. Yeah, so it, it, it was employed by the Special Operations Executive from 1942 to 1944. And this was uh, Churchill's, uh, uh, one of Churchill's ideas and programs to support the French resistance, spies. In fact, the, the, there's a gentleman uh, named on the side, I think you can see it on this side as well. Yeah, Cliff Stewart. His uh, designation was W-5, just like uh, 007. He's a Canadian from the Maritimes who went in with uh, Lysanders and, and it back out again five different times, teaching the French resistance about uh, dynamite and detonators and codes and ciphers and radios and all the stuff that they needed to, to uh, function under the noses of the Gestapo. So this was the program. And uh, they would land spies in France and, and then pick them up again later. So they operated in moonlight, about a week on either side of the uh, full moon. And they would land in just a 
cow pasture in, in France uh, that was suggested by the resistance. So these resistance fighters had already been to England. They'd been trained to select a field so the pilot wouldn't end up hitting trees or wires or end up in a ditch or something right. like that. So th these fields were, you know, supposed to be good for the, uh, for the airplane and for the pilot. But they landed in the dark. And even though this airplane has tremendous uh, landing lights on either side, and it's got a chute in the back for uh, parachute flares. You know, the pilot can release a parachute flare and, and light up the whole world. They couldn't do that because that would tell the Gestapo where they were, right? So um, they landed on the light of three flashlights. So they'd have guys down there in the field shining flashlights up into the sky in an L formation. And the airplane would come in and land you know, towards the leg of the L, plunk it down onto the ground, turn around in the direction of the L, back taxi. As they back taxied, whoever was on board would be bailing out of the airplane, and they had a ladder welded to the uh, this side, the port side of the airplane, an external ladder. So people would be climbing down, and then other people would be climbing back in. And the pilot, of course, he just wanted to spend the smallest amount of time on the ground uh, before you know, a trap was sprung or the Germans would show up with a truckload of guns. So uh, he'd taxi back, they'd swing around, wouldn't shut down the engine, and off they'd go again. Uh, and, and this was a very successful program. They, they didn't lose very many airplanes. Uh, it was, uh, there's a tremendous book about it called We Landed by Moonlight by the fellow who led that program, Hugh Verity. And it's a real eye-opener. So successful is a clandestine, but not as a liaison, I suppose, so you say. And then you, you mentioned about how it flies and the, and the quirks, the history of this particular airplane. Yeah, so this is a Canadian airplane built in uh, Toronto by National Steel Car, uh, where the Toronto Airport, Pearson Airport, is right now, right on the northeast corner of the field in a factory, same factory that later produced the Avro Aero, the jet. And uh, 220 of these were made in Canada. This particular airframe never went overseas. It worked within the training system of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and, uh, from 1942 till the end of the war. And it was used for a number of duties, including gunnery training. So there's a, a hatch under the center, kind of looks like Bombay doors. And you could open that. A big reel would go down, like a big fishing reel. They could let out a 1,000 feet of line with a drogue on the end. And then other aircraft would fly up alongside and practice shooting that. So they were training the gunners for the Lancasters and those other aircraft. Right. How about this particular paint job on this? Is yeah, so uh, this particular airframe was not painted in these colors when it was in operational service. When it was towing the drogue, uh, they made it as bright as possible, right? They, it was uh, uh, what they called the Oxidol paint shop from the uh, laundry detergent. It was yellow and black stripes all the way around the airplane. And uh, that was so that the gunners would shoot the drogue, not the airplane. Whenever they got the messed up, whenever they messed up and they got the, the, the bullets, the tracers and everything a little too close to the airplane, the, the pilot of the Lysander said, hey, we're pulling this thing, not pushing it. So uh, anyway, so it was, this one in its original service was in that stripe paint job, but there was already one flying uh, with that paint job. So we decided to recreate the paint and the scheme, the color scheme of the very first one made uh, in Canada, uh, fin number 416. And this is the way it came out of the factory. So, Well, the restoration to this airplane I was in pretty bad shape when you got it, wasn't it? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so at the end of the war, you know, in Saskatchewan where this became uh, surplus, farmers just bought them because they couldn't otherwise get uh, wires and switches and valves. They needed hardware, and there was a lot of useful hardware in these airplanes, Hurricanes, Lancasters, Blenheims, Bolingbrokes, all those kinds of airplanes. But this uh, Harry Wariat, a, a pilot, collector, farmer in Saskatchewan, uh, got three of them, and uh, he was able to put them all together and, and, and so, yeah, they were all in rough shape. You know, they'd been stripped and parked out in fence rows and behind the barn and that sort of thing. But uh, you can replace uh, wires and, and switches. The basic structure was, was uh, the, the very intact. And this airplane is a 
very original airplane. It's the, it's the opposite of a data plate restoration. We have all kinds of, you know, most of the metal on this is, is original. All this stuff around the spats, I mean, that's not modern and made in an English wheel. That's all original. And, you know, these, these data plates, they were put there by the people in the factory there at National Steel in 1942. So when we got it, we stripped it and took it all apart and replaced uh, some of the wood because it's a, it's a wooden structure. Let me just open this up for you. So as you can see, it's a steel tube structure, uh, but then it's wood in there and then a fabric cover, right? So, hey Steve, uh, I'll just pass you this so it doesn't fly away in this wind. And uh, it's, a, it's a unique airplane. It's light for its volume because of that. It's the combination of steel, wood, and fabric, and aluminum. Uh, made it do its job very well. And, and uh, was How long did it take you to do the restoration? It was about two years. Uh, we had to send the engine overseas. This is a, well, in terms of restoration, Steve, Terry, guys, stand up. We have some of the original restoration crew here, and they drove all the way from Ottawa to, to support the airplane. And Xavier, you stand up, and, and Robin, and, you know, the whole crew here. And then where's John, John and Jeff uh, from Lysander Group? They're here taking pictures somewhere. Um, so... Oh, there they are down there, yeah, the people who are uh, supporting the airplane now. So it was a big effort, big effort to, uh, we had a big team. We had about, was it, 15 guys working steadily every weekend under the management of someone who had already restored one for, right. for the Hamilton right. group. And, uh, yeah, they did a great job. Uh, sometimes it was woodworking school, sometimes it was fabric school, but everybody enjoyed the experience. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, everything's working just fine here uh, 12 years later. Did you do just a little short walk around here? Not one of the big walk around, but a short walk around? A walk around? Yeah, and sure. kind of show us what's going on. Well, um, let's see. Uh, the, Why don't you start the engine? Start the engine? Yeah. <laughs> it's a Bristol Mercury, and it's the only one flying in North America. This is the only Lysander flying in North America. It's 850 horsepower, so it's quite powerful. It's kind of like a Wright 1820 that's in a B-17. It's a geared engine. That's the, uh, the geared assembling at the front there, that bullet. And it's supercharged. It's got a geared supercharger. So it's actually a very powerful engine for its frontal area. And uh, this propeller is uh, not constant speed. It's a de Havilland propeller, and it's either coarse or fine. So that's the only selection you have in a cockpit. Uh, the hardest part about it is getting up and down without falling off. Uh, I can't really demonstrate that in the... I'll do it for the cameras because they can get me on this. Okay. But I'm sorry the airplane's in the way. But, you know, I've learned over the years, I've marked this first uh, footstep with a piece of tape so I can find it. And there, and there, and then I switch hands, and then I switch feet. And I grab it here, and I grab it there. Switch feet again. Other one goes in the stirrup. And then I'm up here ready to change the light bulbs for the airport uh, light stands. So uh, it's a long way up. It really is. <laughs> And uh, uh, I don't know, to get here, I think I was up and down about uh, 200 times on this yeah. flight so far. But uh, the, the point of view, the, the field of view you have is, is great. The seat goes way up and down. And then if you're taxiing around after landing, you can actually un unhook your straps and stand up in the seat practically because it uses a hand brake. Right? It's not toe brakes. It's a pivoting rudder bar down there. And you squeeze the hand brakes. They're pneumatic brakes. And, uh, you know, they're, they're drum brakes, pneumatically powered. And uh, you can steer it while, you can be, while your head is up high and you can actually see where you're going. You can't do S turns in this like you can in a P-51. The, the tail wheel is free castering. You can't lock it straight. It's free castering. And the brakes don't work very well. 
So it's an interesting experience to uh, taxi it around in these narrow taxiways. Initially, it was supposed to be uh, operated out of a grass field, right? A big square 15 acre grass field with you're always landing in the wind, you don't really need brakes, and it works great in that role. But for flying around in modern airports, uh, I have to consider that I can often land situations where I can't taxi. So uh, it's like flying a ski plane or a float plane. You have to think in your head as a pilot, what are you going to do after you land? How am I going to get to, you know, where I have to go, the dock or the... Anyway, so... That's the first thing on the walk around. And the next is all these British fasteners. They tend to, all, all these things, they tend to vibrate loose. So as you, you, you go around with a, either a Zeus tool or, the, or, you know, Swiss Army knife, which is what I use most of the time, and you're always finding some that are loose. These panels all come off in just a few seconds. You saw me demonstrate that. So you gotta go around and make sure all the pins are pushed in hard. The airplane does shake a little bit. And you wouldn't wanna lose one of these things. This is a, uh, a most interesting, unusual. This thing here is the exhaust pipe collector. So the exhaust goes forward into the front of the cowl and then it's collected and put out through this long pipe. This uh, exciter tube goes down the center and can function as a cabin heat for winter if you want to do that. This had made it very quiet during the special operations executive in France. You know, with the, with the engine pulled back a little bit and uh, all the exhaust going through this pipe, it was very quiet. You could fly over a village and no one would know you were there. After that, you go up, like I, we showed you earlier, make sure the flaps and slats are working well working evenly and smoothly. And it's kind of like a regular walk around after that. Well, Dave, we really appreciate it. Thank you for bringing the airplane. Oh, and, Sam, it's a pleasure. Uh, well, and I'd like to, to say, um, well, there's a particular gentleman uh, who was mentioned in the film, uh, John Carswell. His father was Andy Carswell. From, who, who uh, was uh, shot down in a Lancaster, World War II, wrote a great book called Over the Wire, and then he flew these after the war, right? So John was in the RCAF in the early 1980s and uh, runs an investment company, but when this airplane was put up for sale, he thought it should not leave the country. So he went, uh, he put you know, his money where his mouth was, he stepped up and he bought the airplane. So uh, John, Jonathan and Jeff, uh, they're the representatives of John Carswell. John couldn't make it. He's uh, right. he's got a wedding to go to and uh, some other concerns right now. But but it, there's Jeff. Uh, it's, where's Jonathan? Oh, now anyway, the, these sons. <laughs> anyway, uh, they support the owner, and we really appreciate uh, John for for making this all happen and sending us out, even though he wasn't going to be able to join yeah. us. Yeah. You know. Okay. How many veterans do we have? Please stand up. Let's recognize the veterans here. Veterans. And we have some time now for uh, questions. If anybody has any questions, we've got people with mics here. If you just raise your hand. This one. Oh, yeah, I need a microphone. Good. Yeah. Hello. I'm just curious, you said this was the only one in North America. Any idea how many are flying worldwide? How many are left flying? There are two flying in the UK. One at Duxford, and I believe you can go for a ride in that if you want. And then one at the Shuttleworth Collection in the UK. Uh, there's one uh, being restored by Sabina in Belgium, but I don't know what uh, stage it's at. There are quite a few in museums, but I'm just talking about flying airplanes. Over here. Uh, you mentioned that's the only uh, British Mer Mercury in North America, and I think you were going to go into it earlier as far as who did the engine work. You had to send it overseas. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, this engine is made out of unobtainium now. I mean, we didn't want to come here without a spare cylinder in a box in case we blew a jug, right? Could not find one. So, um, 
It, it is a rare experience to fly a Bristol Mercury, and uh, it's not going to last forever, you know. Um, it's, there, there are spares, but there are so few now that uh, everyone who has them is hoarding them, just like I would. You can't blame them. And uh, to, to find uh, parts is, is really difficult. So, yeah, this was restored by uh, John Remain's outfit, ARC, at Duxford. Uh, this engine was overhauled, was zero-timed uh, in about 2008. And it only has about 100 hours on it. And I suspect it'll go four or 500 hours at the power settings that I'm using. So uh, I think we still have time on it. And uh, who knows, that'll be a number of years before we have to overhaul it again, I hope. Let me see, where's wood? Where's wood? Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe there will be more parts available by then. I sure hope so. Can you, can, can you speak about pilot training and can it be flown from the back seat? I'm sorry. Say, can you speak about pilot training for their aircraft and can it be flown from the back seat? Yeah, well, pilot training in this is uh, a big conundrum, right? Because it flies differently from everything else. And in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, just like here in the States, generally the pilot maker was the T-6, the Harvard, right? But it's not really good preparation for this, and that's why there are lots of pictures of crashed Lysanders by the side of the runway from that period. So what I found most useful is to get into the British frame of mind. Um, British airplanes are different from North American airplanes. Not better, not worse, but different. You know, you look at the turn and bank, instrument, which is a great big thing. It's got two pointers on it, and the top one is the ball, not the bottom one, right? You got to get used to little things like that. You got to get used to a no-break kind of an airplane. So if, you, if you've ever flown a moth that has, uh, it's a British one, that has no brakes and just a tail skid, that's good trainer. Uh, so um, to, to, you have to do the research and get the briefings and understand the foibles of this airplane before you fly it. But it's, it's handy if you're, if you've been flying oddball types where you, where you don't have good brakes and you don't have good steering. Crosswind landings. Sorry? Crosswind landings. Crosswind landing. landing. It's actually not bad in a crosswind. The uh, rudder is quite effective. And you generally just two-point it, like a you know side slip and three-point landing, except you're touching down on the up, upwind main and on the tailwheel. You can wheel land it, but there's a lot of bounce in this structure. It's kind of like landing a Cetabria. You know, any energy you feed into it is coming right back at you, and you get thrown back up into the air. It tends it tends to track pretty straight. So I, I'm comfortable uh, on a cross country with a ten knot crosswind. I could probably. Do a little more, but I'd rather not. What's you know. Speed? Well, I come in at 80, uh, but you, you're going to touch down at about miles 60. Hour or not? Yeah, miles an hour. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd be touching down at about 60, 65. And um, but it's funny, these brakes are never the same. Like always, one brakes a little better than the other. So sometimes, if the wind's between two runways, you'll pick the one where if you have to use brake to stay straight, you got the better brake. Right? So again, you're thinking about what you're going to do after you touch down, before you commit to it. And there are times you can land this airplane and you can't taxi it. So, you know, if it's a strong wind, you can land directly into it and that's great, but you have a heck of a time doing a 180, right? And I often take somebody like Xavier in the back seat so he can jump out, put his shoulder to the back of the airplane, turn it around so I'm going the vector I want, and then he pops back in and we taxi towards the ramp. It's an awkward thing uh, in a, on a windy day. Yeah, here at Oshkosh, I'd, I'd get towed out to the runway or right. very close yeah. to it. Yes, sir. The, uh, the Mercury's a sleeve valve engine? No, uh, Bristol made both, right? And uh, the Lysander II had a Perseus, which was a sleeve valve. This is the Lysander III, and these are uh, poppet valve uh, engines with the Bristol Mercury. There's four valves on each cylinder, like two exhaust, two intake, and uh, they're exposed valve uh, stems, which is actually pretty handy if you're trying to diagnose whether or not you got a stuck valve, and I was in that situation coming out here. These cowlings come off quite simply. They take a couple of people because they're big and clumsy, but just a couple of diaper pins and 
big over center hooks, and then boom, you got one off, boom, you got the other off. And then you got all nine cylinders exposed. And then, you know, you can uh, close the valve and then just put a, ha a wooden handle on the end of the stem and push it and make sure it's not stuck. Very simple uh, and very good. I, I like that aspect of the design. They did make, they did operate some in Canada with the sleeve valve engine, the Perseus, uh, but they're hard to operate in the cold of a Canadian winter because the sleeves tend to gum up and, and uh, hard to keep them warm enough to, to run. Are you going to fly it in the show? I hope so. I think uh, today today's a jet day, right? Uh, yeah. Besides which, I'm not at the briefing. But uh, we'll see about tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I'd like to I'd like to fly it very much in the show. But as I say, it depends on the wind. And a day like this, I'd, I'd be reluctant to do it. But there was a second one in Canada that was yellow and black, and you mentioned this was the only one. Yes. Time. What happened to it? Well, it suffered an engine failure. Yeah, I was flying this one around that year, and uh, the pilot's here on the grounds. I don't know. Rick, are you in the stands? Uh, okay, he's a judge here, so he's probably doing some, uh, yeah. some of that kind of work today. And he said it went from smooth, calm, lovely day to crunch, and prop stopped in about five seconds as the engine ate itself inside. So uh, then he had to dead stick it in and... Uh, salvage uh, the airframe? The, well, the, the, uh, he didn't have the best choices. He was in an area with a lot of power lines and hydro and uh, windmills. So um, he, he got down fine and both himself and the passenger were 100%, you know, fine, no problem. But uh, one, of these, uh, land, one of these gave way so uh, they haven't restored the airplane yet. I mean, it's, it's all very doable, but it's just a question. You know, museums have priorities about what they're going to. So if there's a, a donor who wants to sponsor that restoration in the audience, you know, there's an opportunity there. Yes, sir. Yeah, a question. Would you ever consider modifying anything for, like, the brakes, to, you know, re-engineering anything? Or yeah. for the turning, with maybe putting some... Baffles yes. Or, uh, or well, um, yeah. this airplane that the, that was the question was just asked oh, about the one from Hamilton. They put hydraulic brakes on it, uh, and it, is, it was just as bad. It's something to do uh, with the, the <laughs> something to do with the architecture of this whole. It, well, did, did they put tow brakes on it also? Or just it's still the handle. I think they 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 still use the handle if I remember right, but they put basically the brakes off a of Cessna 310 on it. I yeah. Believe. Okay. And uh, it didn't really help. Someone asked about the back. Uh, sorry, was the, uh, just operating the canopy. Uh, the person in the back seat can open and close the canopy uh, very easily, and you can do it at any speed. There's no limitation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When it was flown into an occupied country, how many people could they get in it? Well, with, oh, this, with 850 yeah. horse and these big wings, you can carry anything you can get inside it. So it's kind of volume limited rather than weight limited. So if someone was running away from the Germans and this was their only way out, they didn't care about comfort, right? And so there was one case that actually put five people in the back seat. Where right now, we just have one. They just cram people in. Yes, sir. That exhaust cowling is beautifully done. I'm wondering how unique it is to this aircraft or had it been incorporated in other designs? I had never seen it incorporated in any other designs. It's not a great idea to have the hot part at the front of the engine, right? Because uh, it, is the, it overheats on landing. It overheats on the ground because uh, you've you know, got a big hot thing at the front warming up air that's then going through the cylinders. I, uh, when I landed here, I had to shut down in the grass out there, just pull the plug, because I didn't want the cylinders to overheat and crack you know, while I was here. So um, I, I, don't, it wouldn't, I mean, it's beautiful, and it's shapely, and you know, it's very streamlined and all that. But sooner or later, the exhaust gases are going to corrode this. There's no way around that. And um, frankly, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that as a design, but that's what we have to live with, right? That's the way they did it. Anyone else? I would, I would just say something else, Sam. Uh, yeah, go ahead. A lot of people link this up in kind of the same category as the Fiesler Storch, and uh, that's not really correct. The, uh, the, the Storch is supreme at stoll, but it can only go slow. One thing about this is you can, you can fly it at 200 miles an hour if you want. 
you know, if you actually put the throttle up. It's very streamlined. I encourage you to walk in front of it later and look down. It's a very streamlined airplane. And if you tried to do 200 miles an hour in a storch, you know, you just rip the wings off. What's the range on the airplane? Uh, it's got a 95 imperial gallon tank, and it burns just under 30 imperial gallons an hour at the power settings I'm using. So it's about three hours to a dry tank. So uh, after about two hours, I'm looking for a place well, what, to land. How long were the missions over missions there? Missions were much longer. So they had an external tank underneath that looked like a torpedo, and uh, it had uh, fuel in that. So they also had to put a bigger oil tank in it to, for those five. It would be two and a half hours into France and two and a half hours back. What does the what does the oil burn on this normal? Well, it it uh, depends on the uh, temperature. It's going. It's like an eighteen twenty in a B seventeen in okay. many ways, right? So, uh, you know, it, two to four quarts an hour is yeah, not unusual. Right. It's pretty standard, and uh, a lot of it gets pushed out, and and then you're looking for volunteers to help you clean the belly of the airplane after you land. Okay. Anyone else? Well, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. We really Sam. appreciate it. That's very unique. But we're not done yet. This is Sam's birthday. Okay, this is Sam's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sam. Happy birthday to you. A real professional <laughs> singer, too. By the way, if you guys want to hear him sing, go on Go on the, the YouTube and look up Dave Hatfield and uh, look up, what is it, My Canada? Uh, in, there's that's, yeah, one of them's called In that's, Canada. That's a in, good one. That's in a good one. Canada, and, it'll, yeah. and it'll refer you to others. And it's he and his brother, the astronaut, are singing, and they're very good. Uh, we have a lot of fun. Anyway, Thank have you. a great time at Oshkosh. <laughs>